So we're going to go transition again. Happy birthday, Marge. Um, we're going to transition into watching a film. Uh, I was able to work with Keith Kwan, uh, or Cake Keith Kwan, and they have a culture camp that they run every summer. And two summers ago, I was able to visit them, and they asked me to take film because it was their 30th anniversary. So Bjorn Olsen, who you just saw, who created the film regarding our salmon, our salmon subsistence, he actually helped me out uh, in doing the editing for this film. I had several hours of interviews and beautiful footage and getting ready for the conference. So he jumped right in, rolled up his sleeves, and we're just waiting for the community because they said they wanted some of their audio and some of their landmark footage to put in there. So I'm just gonna share with you where we're at to this point. It's a rough cut, but I wanted this story to be shared in this venue because our conference, the theme was about subsistence and maintaining our way of life in perpetuity. And also we have to translate to people the importance of our activities. It's more than just nutrients, right? It's more, um, it's our culture, but it's also our spirit and our connection to creator and who we are. And so when we stop having that connection to land and the other nations like the salmon nations or the plant nations, when we lose that connection, we actually lose our spirit as well. And so this story helps to translate this maybe for the Western mind and how important it is to have our traditional activities. So I'm going to go ahead and share that screen. So just give me one moment while I get it loaded. Okay, and we're going to hit play. It's our 30th anniversary this year. We're at the cake, the 30th annual cake culture camp. It's the organized village of cake. Our staff puts it on totally. We fundraise, we get donations from uh, the different companies we deal with. And uh, it's located out at a traditional site. This brother. right at the top. 30th anniversary this year. We're at the Sorry, cake, everybody, the I started over because I didn't realize if I put my computer on mute that it needed the video. So. Organized Village of Cake. Our staff puts it on totally. We fundraise. We get donations from um, the different companies we deal with. And uh, it's located out at a traditional site of Walter Williams Sr., and his um, son, Walter Williams, Jr., and we thank them for it. We're out in the Cape Tribal Corporation area. It came about um, because back then we had a rash of suicides, about 15 suicides in a year and a half or so. Alaska Daily News in Anchorage did an article, a series of articles, one whole week of it, called People in Pearl. 1987, and they wrote about Alaska, and one section was on cake. And I did not know we had the highest rate of suicides in the state of Alaska. The state of Alaska had the highest rate of suicides in the nation. Where did they put us? Right at the top. So that's when we really started addressing it. 
So in 1987, 1988, we started this. We said, we're going to do this ourselves. We have to save, try to save our people. Me and me got together and tried to figure out a way to help our people to get in a different mindset. And it seems to have worked. We had the record for the suicide rate. So the state was putting a lot of money into um, suicide prevention. And our council um, proposed that we uh, start doing cultural activities with um, suicide prevention money. And this was one of the... This was one of the activities. Starting the dance group was one of them. We did arts and crafts, um, regalia sewing. <clears throat> so 30 years ago, this camp um, got started because it was because the, um, we had such a high rate of suicide. A lot of our, our uh, realization was that we needed to we needed to make sure that our youth had a had a solid foundation and know where they came from knew who they are as a people, as part of our community, so that they they understood that they had value. I got three boys working with kids. It's, you know, there's nothing nothing more more honorable than the showing kids how to live a good life, you know, using our culture to to make good choices. There's a phrase in Clinkett and they don't know it. But it says take, you have to take the stones out of your mouth when it's starting to affect your grandchildren and your future generations, and you're losing people. Because I've been a magistrate judge for 30 years, and I retired last year, 27 years. And I know through statutes that you have every right to take your own life. Simple as that. But in our culture, it's not right. And that's when I quoted, we had to take our stones out of our mouths because we need to start talking to the different people about it. We have third generation campers out here. And since camp started, our, our um, suicide rate has, has gone down. Um, we haven't had a suicide in, in years now. Years. Yeah. And what we try to instill is that not everything that you do um, comes with uh, a type of reward that you can take with you, but the reward of helping someone in need, that's the reward in itself to help someone who's without someone who needs or even taking care of an elder or families that might need you know, a little bit of extra food, you know, that don't know how. Then you say, hey, come with me. I'll show you how to fish. I'll take you with me. I'll show you how to hunt. My grandfather, when he was passing on, he charged us with, you know, Sonny Boy, you have to, we have to become human again. He said, that's Clinkett. That's who we are. He said, we have to try to help these, our people out to break that chain of abuse, domestic violence, child neglect, and suicides. And that took a big hit on me, thinking about some people were unfortunate to even grow up around what we did. And I was, and that connected um, what was going on in our community where we were able to draw on a bunch of elders that there were the ones that settled the community down because they came out there and they talked they brought it out we have our elders night elders night we we encourage as many elders as possible to come out and tell stories because that's that's the history of our our culture the is the um the oral storytelling so we, we want to continue that and we invite as many as, as are willing and able to come out here and, and share with the youth. Because even in as small as our town is, they don't all all come together for any specific reason and talk. I rely on their, everybody's knowledge to, so these kids get a different view on how to put up food um, for the winter.
you know, that's basically what we do here. This is like a, a fish camp. And these kids nowadays, they know so much more of our language than I, I do. <laughs> so it's getting better and better, and we just want to continue that as much as we can in, in any way that we can. And camp is one of the, one of, I think one of the good ways because they learn so much more of the processes of our culture versus um, just <laughs> picture cards. It's, it's, not, it's not hard once you leave from the front. Uh, a lot of my skills come from being in the, uh, in the military. I was a Marine. And I was also in Alaska National Guard. And the one thing that I take from that is you lead from the front. And as long as you show them how to do things and talk to them at the same time, rather than saying, hey, we're going to do this, I think it, it gets them more involved. You're, it's never hopeless if you're able to talk, to share your burden. Because my father said sometimes in the old days they'd have a pack sack on their back and a pack sack in the front. They could see what the pack sack was, contents in the front. And in the back you didn't. Sometimes you needed help to get something out. And that's where you called on one another. Sometimes you didn't even remember what was in the back. But people that's walking with you, they can look. And that's helping out, he said. That's what... Uh, not he, that blanket, that chill cat blanket, you feel how heavy it is? They say that's all the caretakers that have it contributed to their community and the responsibility of a caretaker to put that blanket around people that are feeling right, that need help, and that may, they may need some guidance. The beauty of it? And the weight of it is what we're charged with trying to help young people or people that are lost, people that are searching for their soul. E -import. <laughs> <laughs> I know with the age group that they're old enough. Thanks so much. Yeah. You want to? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. If you can cook for that many people, then you're a real village person. <laughs> oh, man. Kamishish to the people of Cape. Kamishish to Dion for your excellent work in helping to bring it this far. And I'm looking forward to sharing it out when it's completed as well with everybody. And um, for those of you who don't know me, Dion being the coordinator for TELS, 2020, I'm a plants educator and a traditional healer, sure. and yes. getting people out on the land, right? There's so much to that process. You have the physical exercise, which is good for us. You have the heightened nutrients, which is good for us. When you're out amongst the plants, you have the color therapy. You have the, um, there's molecules that the plants release, right? They're oils and pheromones. And so you end up receiving aromatherapy, and it actually helps you attune to nature. Um, and thankfully, you know, Western science is finally starting to catch up to understand what we've been talking about and how important it is, even just standing barefoot and receiving those negative ions to help, you know, in, invigorate the body. And then you start going in and creating relationships and not just a, a relationship in a short period of time. We have stories, you know, that are 10,000, 20,000 years old that teach us how to be a good relative, how to be in relationship with the land and the animals and the water and each other. And with climate change, that's some of the stories that have been shared with me with medicine people and elders from Alaska, from Canada, from the Low 48, from Mexico. When you listen to the stories, the fundamental core teachings is for us to transition through these changing times, which they saw coming. We have stories from our elders from a long time ago that said Alaska is going to be warm again. Um, but it's going to happen very quickly. It's going to happen very rapidly, something that we haven't seen before. And it will be up to the indigenous people to teach everyone how to be real human beings again. 
How do we live in this world? And what is our purpose? Our divine purpose, our sacred purpose as humans is to care and tend the land and to help create a healthier, more abundant space for all of the nations, right? The plant nations, the animal nations, the fish nations, and the human nations as well. And so I'm, I'm thankful to be able to help coordinate this event and also for the work that I get to do with our communities. So with that, we're going to actually transition over to Junior. They're getting ready. Um, with your registration, you received, uh, hopefully, if you registered in time, a cultural project. And for those of you who may not have received it, I do need your address for it to be mailed out. And we'll actually continue mailing out the cultural projects until we hit 200. I think I have like maybe 20 or 30 left um, that aren't claimed because I don't have mailing addresses for them. And so if you send me your mailing address, then I can send out a cultural packet to you. And then you can actually come back and look at this content because everything in this conference is being recorded. And then it's going to be available on this site um, for three months. And then after that, we're transitioning it to the Region 10 RTOX YouTube page. And then you can access the cultural project on this site or on our YouTube page and follow along. And you can make your own octopus bag at home. Um, there are some different varying conversations about where it came from. One of the stories I heard from Becky Atukyuk is that it was um, a trade. We, we got this design in trade. And so it is referenced towards the Diné people because it looks like one of their trade bags. And then we generally have a seaweed pattern on it. And the seaweed pattern is actually traded through the Simshian who did the land uh, trades over to the eastern part of the United States with the Cree. And so that's how far the um, seaweed pattern came from. And that's something to think about our native peoples and pre-contact is, you know, people who don't know any better may think that we were siloed from each other and kind of these individual spaces, but that's not true. Actually, as a Thinget person, we had trade routes that went thousands of miles inland where we would take high-grade marine oils from Uligan or Seal, and we would trade them interior with interior peoples. And we also had seafaring trade routes where we actually traded all the way down to Central America, and we have stories of relationship with Hawaii and New Zealand, and um, we're all connected. And we know because of our stories from pre-contact of our migration routes and how to be good relatives to each other.